I would like to welcome uh, Michael Sweeney and uh, Dr. Taylor Burr for the next uh, talk. Uh, They're gonna give this talk together. Uh, Dr. Sweeney is child neurologist with a special interest in pediatric neuroimmunology uh, at uh, Northern Children's Neuroscience Institute. After fin finishing his uh, medical school in Wisconsin, he trained in uh, Cincinnati Children's Hospital for his child neurology residency. He received a fellowship to pursue his uh, passion of uh, pediatric neuroimmunology at uh, University of Utah. Uh, his current interests are multiple sclerosis, transverse myelitis, and other inflammatory disorders of the central nervous system. And uh, Dr. Burr is our uh, PGY graduating resident. Um, he obtained his medical degree from University of North Texas Health Center. And uh, he will be pursuing his uh, pediatric epilepsy fellowship uh, in Texas next year. Uh, then uh, I would let the speakers uh, start the presentation. All right, can you hear us all right? Yes. All right. So we got the pleasure of presenting on a hot topic, um, the neurologic manifestations of and complications of COVID-19 in children. So um, I'm going to turn it over to Dr. Burr. So there were five kind of main areas we wanted to address with this talk. Uh, we'll go over those briefly and then kind of get to it. The first is really sort of as things were getting started um, in the winter last year and things were we started hearing case reports um, different presentations involving the nervous system. We'll kind of talk about those and what we saw in adults and sort of some of the early patient populations. Uh, after that, we'll shift gears a little bit and talk about different ways that um, the SARS-CoV-2 uh, virus is known to enter the nervous system and cause kind of direct pathogenesis as well as some indirect mechanisms. For, uh, for after that, we will move on to really talk more specifically about larger cohorts, about um, its presentation in kids um, including the MISC, which I know has been um, something that we've seen a lot in our hospital over the past year. Um, following that, we'll look at a couple different um, imaging findings that we've seen and some sort of uh, different types of presentations of um, COVID in kids throughout the, the past year or so. Um, and then finally, we'll end up talking about long COVID. Um, so sort of the manifestations, some of which have kind of gone on and on for um, months at a time in some of the patients, what we know about that and what we can expect from our uh, patients that we see. So beginning, um, kind of, again, right at the start of things when we were having big cases kind of outbreaking in, um, in Europe, Italy, Spain, some of those places, we started hearing kind of speculating, you know, is this going to be something that is uh, invading the nervous system, causing big problems? Um, I remember, you know, March, February of last year hearing about the anosmia. Um, it being sort of a sign or maybe a predictor of poor outcomes, invasion of the nervous system, those sorts of things. But you also heard case reports and sort of discussion of all sorts of other uh, parts of the nervous system. So um, we heard strokes, seizures, different myopathies, uh, inflammatory conditions such as Guillain-Barre or acute transverse myelitis. The, a pretty early and pretty large study that was published um, was actually from a single hospital in Spain that was from all their patients, so all the adult patients that were admitted over uh, March 2020, so pretty early on. Um, they reported that around 60%, so 57% of the patients that were admitted, the adult patients had some sort of neurologic symptom. Um, but as you sort of go through and look more specifically at the symptoms they were having, a lot of them were kind of nonspecific and really things you would sort of expect in people who had some sort of virus in general. So myalgias, headaches, maybe some somnolence, um, I, I do want to call special attention to some of the rarer things that they saw, but certainly more relevant to us today is seizures, uh, one or so percent of those patients had seizures and movement disorders, and they saw sort of increased strokes in some of those patients as well. And then something that I don't think gets uh, quite enough uh, or, uh, recognition, but neuropsychiatric symptoms that were seen in these patients. Um, so someone would be mindful of as you take care of them, particularly with another way to possibly come. So, these are sort of the more specific things that we've seen. Um, you know, things that don't necessarily get a neurologist called for, but things to be aware of and to watch out for. Um, myalgias, headache, clearly. Um, this graph actually breaks down, or this table breaks down the non-severe patients and the severe patients. So those that, you know, needed to be in the ICU or there for longer periods of time. And those that, you know, showed up, had it, maybe needed a little uh, TLC in the hospital for a couple of days, but didn't have um, significant ramifications of COVID. Um, so we can see that 
myalgias and headache, we're seeing at roughly equal amounts in those two or percentages in those two um, cohorts of patients. Um, interestingly, the anosmia and the dysthesia was actually seen less frequently in the severe patients as opposed to the non-severe patients. So that kind of put to rest some fears that that was an early marker of um, something um, you know, bad that was coming, that it had already invaded the nervous system, that bad things were on the way. Um, and then somnolence, and stupor, and coma, again, pretty non-specific. Uh, as expected, we saw more coma and stupor with the more severely affected, but a pretty high proportion, you know, almost 81% um, or uh, sorry, 17% of the uh, non-severe patients um, having somnolence. Moving a little bit more towards things you in general would call or consult a neurologist for, um, epilepsy, so seizures, we're seeing uh, more so in the severe cohort of these adults. Um, they did see uh, something uh, with uh, elevated levels of creatinine kinase. So again, that was seen more frequently in the more severe cohort of these patients. Uh, some of them had even had rhabdo and uh, following myopathies. It's kind of hard to parse out if that was due to them being severe patients, them being in the ICU, not being able to be moved a lot and intubated, things like that for several days, or if it was due to direct invasion itself. Um, strokes were seen in both cohorts, uh, hemorrhages, kind of automatically put people, intracranial hemorrhage, put people more into the severe category anyways, that was seen a couple of times. And then hyperkinetic movement disorders were actually seen in a couple of the more severe patients that were probably severe for other reasons, but started having these um, abnormal movements that were um, more present, not, uh, not there at the onset. And the neuropsychiatric symptoms, as I had mentioned, um, pretty common. They were seen uh, pretty frequently, almost 18% of the non-severe uh, patients, and then a little bit more frequent in the severe patients, ranging from anxiety, depression, poor sleep, and even psychosis. What I would like to draw your attention to before uh, moving on to the next topic is, it was actually very rare for these um, adults that presented to this hospital in this cohort of patients to come in with a neurologic symptom. So only 21 of the you know, 840 patients um, presented with a neurologic symptom. And even those were tended to be kind of nonspecific. It was uh, being a little confused um, maybe about uh, uh, some with strokes, but you know, presenting with seizures or syncope or those sorts of things is not very common in this uh, big group of people. So that kind of, uh, you know, with all of this data, it sort of led the uh, scientific community to think back about previous coronaviruses and what we knew about them and start investigating and sort of seeing how these mechanisms could happen and what could be happening that it could be causing um, problems in the central nervous system itself. Okay. <clears throat> so, I remember way back in February of 2020 asking our um, infectious disease fellow, do I need to be worried about this virus from a neurologic perspective? Um, that's starting to get some news. And um, there, was, there was really no information at the time about um, the infectivity of this virus or why this virus was um, something to be worried about. Um, obviously, we've learned a whole lot of information since that time. So this coronavirus um, is a single-stranded RNA virus that's transmitted via droplets. I think everybody knows this by now. Um, what it does is it binds to, um, with the utilization of the spike protein that it expresses on its membrane, to the ACE2 receptor. Um, and this, it has a much higher affinity than the, its predecessor, the SARS-CoV-1 virus, and in doing such, increases its infectivity. Uh, this uh, enzyme is present in all the different tissues in your body, but at a much higher concentration in certain tissues like the uh, epithelial cells of your pulmonary digestive tracts uh, or in your nasopharynx. And um, so once the, the virus binds to this receptor, um, it enters a cell and it starts to replicate. Um, there's a number of different mechanisms which uh, we think leads to um, direct invasion or um, infection into the brain or nervous system, uh, whether that's via retrograde transport um, through the axons um, or through spread through the lymphatic system or through the blood. Um, we know that it does get into the brain and spinal cord or at least has effects there. Um, uh, one of the, the most common symptoms that we hear about are you know, loss of smell and taste probably from direct invasion um, of those cranial nerves that are involved in those um, pathways. So once a virus is um, taken up into the epithelial cell and starts to um, replicate, 
your immune system starts to, to act. And um, there's your adaptive immune system um, is activated and the virus is um, targeted. Um, but what is unique to this specific virus, um, maybe not unique, but uh, a key feature of it is that it induces a, a very um, exaggerated inflammatory cascade. So we, see, we tend to see much higher levels of inflammatory markers um, in this um, infection compared to many other um, respiratory viruses. Um, that massive release of cytokines um, then leads to uh, recruitment of other inflammatory cells, T cells, macrophages, and you get this whole uh, body um, inflammatory situation that happens. All right. So kind of similar to the ALBA COVID uh, that we talked about in adults, I'm going to talk now about a um, much kind of larger study. It was, it was a really big study. It was done here in the United States, looked at 61 different hospitals, pretty, pretty widespread, 31 different states, um, much longer time period. So as opposed to just being over the months of March that got that um, cohort of 840 patients, this one ran uh, was analyzed from March 15th through December 15th, so a good nine months. Um, got about twice as many patients, around 1,700 children uh, that were hospitalized in the acute setting with COVID. They found that around 21% of those patients, so 365 patients, had some sort of neurologic involvement. This study being done by pediatricians was useful um, in that it paid special attention to kind of pre-existing conditions that we see more commonly in some of our patients. You know, most pediatricians that work in the hospital know some of our kids with chronic neurologic disorders, or kind of longstanding disorders present sort of more frequently. And this paid a little bit more special attention to that, which I thought was um, uh, pertinent to share with you guys. Um, so as I said, um, previously healthy was pretty similar to the total amount around 21% of those kids that were admitted with COVID had some sort of neurologic symptom while ill. Uh, that rate was almost double in kids that had a pre-existing neurologic condition of some sort. So around almost 43% of those kids had some manifestation, whether it was new or a kind of continuation or a worsening of their previous symptoms. Also important about the study is it took into account age, um, kids not just being smaller adults. Uh, we saw a different um, sort of uh, distribution of types of symptoms that were seen, uh, specifically in the much younger age groups, less than five. We saw much higher rates of seizures uh, complicating uh, these patients' hospitalizations as opposed to um, kind of the loss of taste, smell, headaches, those sorts of things that were really more equivalent to what we saw in uh, the adult cohort. Um, this specifically breaks down uh, looking at kids that had an underlying uh, neurologic condition. Um, so by far and away, the ones that were more involved neurologically was kids that had pre-existing seizure disorders. Uh, that was the, the highest as opposed to those with neuromuscular disorders, autism. You can see uh, kind of the comparison between whether or not their um, admissions with acute COVID was complicated by further neurologic involvement or not. Again, seizure disorders being the, the most likely um, knowing, again, that all these kids were at higher risk because of their underlying neurologic condition. Looking at some other features, um, it, there wasn't a big difference in sort of the proportions of kids that had a previous cardiac history or respiratory history, whether or not they ended up having um, neurologic manifestations or not, um, with the caveat there being uh, genetic or metabolic conditions. Um, but that was a fairly small amount. It did seem that they were kind of twice as likely, 3%, so 6%. But again, um, relatively small uh, amounts. It's not kind of a shoe in It's an automatic thing that you know someone that comes in with autism or something like that is going to have um, is going to have neurologic manifestations as well. And then um, looking at sort of how severely um, some of these patients were and whether or not the, the neurologic manifestations. So patients that came in that had severe courses, were they more or less likely to have had neurologic manifestations? And this was actually also um, somewhat telling. It did seem that um, there were more neurologic manifestations than those that had more severe courses that needed to be in the ICU and those sorts of things. But interestingly, it didn't change the uh, length of stay. They spent a little bit more time in the ICU maybe, um, just kind of looking at that range. But uh, overall tended to do kind of similarly as far as the duration of stay. Um, they did have an increased risk of death, however, uh, about four times as high, uh, but still pretty low, you know, 1% versus 4%. Um, interestingly, uh, 20, so around 5% of those that had a neurologic involvement left the hospital with some new neurologic deficit, whether that was permanent or not, uh, this study didn't go into. 
Um, but they did report that in a couple of patients that apparently also didn't have a neurologic deficit. Um, so kind of hard to say exactly what uh, was happening there. And then increased risk of these kids that had neurologic presentations or manifestations uh, while they were acutely ill uh, had to go to rehab at higher rates as well. All right. So um, by now, I'm assuming also people have heard of um, this condition, MISC or multi-system inflammatory syndrome. This is a uh, really severe um, inflammatory state where kids present with fever, rash, conjunctivitis, they can have edema, um, a lot of pain symptoms, a lot of GI symptoms, and they can get effusions pretty much um, any pleural surface. This, uh, you can think of this similarly to how uh, you think about Kawasaki's, um, it's quite analogous. Um, the criteria for this um, that we're using currently is uh, a fever greater than 38 degrees, um, some laboratory findings that could include a neutrophilia or lipopenia, um, elevated inflammatory markers or procalcitonin, elevated D-dimer um, or specific uh, cytokine markers like an elevated IL-6. Um, these are uh, multi-system, so greater than two organ systems should be involved and then obviously should have a um, positive um, COVID test. Um, really, these kids tend to present um, quite close in, in temporal proximity to their infection, so definitely within four weeks of symptom onset. Um, so question for, that we had to answer was, you know, do people with, uh, do kids with MISC um, have more neurologic involvement, um, or what are the neurologic manifestations of MISC? Well, it turns out that uh, a specific neurologic involvement is quite rare. So in this UK cohort, um, only four of 27 patients were noted to have neurologic involvement. Um, and they tend to be fairly nonspecific things like encephalopathy or headache. Um, only one of those kids had a meningismus or ataxia. The EEG, um, when it was available uh, in this group, just included some kids with slowing, mild slowing. Um, and only two kids had uh, lumbar punctures performed and those studies were normal. In the US cohort, um, the, this paper that Tyler was referencing, um, there's a much larger number of kids reported on um, who had um, neurologic involvement with um, COVID. Um, in this group, um, there was 616 children had uh, met criteria for MASC. That's, um, out of the um, 1,695 included in the study. So that's a third of patients went on to meet criteria for this. So it's relatively common. Um, so of the people who had, of the kids who had neurologic involvement of their COVID, um, that's 365, 126 met criteria. So again, about 35%. Um, all right, so um, of the uh, people who had um, COVID and um, MISC um, or more severe um, COVID manifestations, um, rare or uh, life-threatening neurologic conditions were quite rare. So only two and a half percent of people were described as having life-threatening neurologic conditions. And these included a severe encephalopathy, um, strokes, ADEM or post-infectious encephalitis, um, there were a couple of patients that reported um, had this acute fulminant cerebral edema um, and four patients who had Guillain-Barre syndrome. Um, so death was rare um, in the overall cohort, but um, you can see that of the people who had severe encephalopathy, stroke, or this acute fulminant cerebral edema, the death rates um, were higher. Um, all right. And shifting gears a little bit, uh, we're going to talk about some of these more severe um, manifestations that we've seen in children and just talk about some imaging findings. Um, so the first is a kind of an ADEM-like. Uh, these are two patients from a uh, kind of big study of uh, neuroradiologists from around the world that were kind of comparing um, cases. The, the first of these, the first two pictures, A and B, is a 14-month-old girl uh, who had an acute COVID presented with encephalopathy and seizures. She had this flare hyperintensity and diffusion restriction of her white matter pretty diffusely. Uh, a similar sort of thing, a little bit more patchy, 
uh, was seen in a 13-year-old boy who also had fever. Uh, he, interestingly, also had um, spine hyperintensities uh, and had lower limb weakness as well. So he was kind of hit on both part, or two different kind of general areas of his immune system, of his nervous system. Focal neuritis, um, so kind of focal neurologic deficits have been seen as well. Um, here is a couple images representing a uh, acute facial paralysis um, that was seen in a five-year-old. Um, a little bit more widespread was this nine-year-old seen in pictures C, D, E, and F, who had you know, kind of much wider, non-classic kind of COVID, um, you know, wasn't, didn't have fevers, didn't have these um, acres worth of breathing, but really just kind of came in with multiple uh, nerves uh, independently seen on, radio, on uh, imaging that had enhancement uh, that explained the symptoms pretty well. And then the last was actually a, uh, another 13-year-old, so a little bit older, who came in with uh, vertigo, a new onset vertigo. Uh, and he actually had a kind of acute labyrinthitis and then uh, obliteration of his semicircular canal that likely explained his symptoms. Again, not really related to a kind of classic COVID hospitalization story. There were some cases of um, some pretty significant damage to the spinal cord itself. Um, so this is actually sort of a series of pictures of the same three-year-old girl who came in with respiratory failure. Uh, she was PCR positive on her COVID. The first two pictures at the top, A and B, are kind of right when she came in. They did an MRI of her lumbar spine and found this pretty extensive uh, lesion. Uh, a couple of days later, they repeated that study and found it was actually worsening. She had contrast enhancement and it had spread some. And then unfortunately for this little girl, uh, three weeks later, they repeated one more time and it really showed kind of the, the amount of damage that this had caused in her spinal cord that she had this persistent contrast enhancement, these signs of necrosis um, kind of all the way down from her brainstem down at least to her uh, C-spine. Um, we also, as we mentioned in the adult cohort, uh, vascular events are, you know, they happen, they're common. Um, common is not the right word, but they are something to watch out for. Um, so, this is actually several 15-year-old girls, different ones, um, the first of which had um, either press or kind of lacunar infarcts that showed up uh, in the setting of seizures. Um, C and D describe a, another 15-year-old girl that came in with a um, sinus venous thrombosis in her superior sagittal sinus and corresponding infarct related to that. And then the last sequence of pictures, or sorry, E was a girl with MISC that had these uh, microthrombi shown on her SWE imaging kind of scattered throughout the brain. And the last series of pictures, F, G, H, and I, was a two-year-old girl who um, had uh, kind of small infarcts in her brainstem that uh, led her to develop ophthalmoplegia, cerebral ataxia that they could actually uh, isolate on imaging. All right. So what are we seeing locally? Um, so, you know, these papers um, report on all of these rare manifestations that um, people have seen all across the country, so really small numbers of kids with rare complications spread across the country. Um, so locally, what, we, what we've really seen in the hospital, we see kids who have chronic diseases. Um, so kids who have cerebral palsy or who have um, congenital heart problems or um, chronic diseases who get COVID have more severe complications with increase in seizure frequency, um, worsening spasticity, those types of things. Um, we have seen a couple of rare complications from COVID, including a, a kid who ended up being diagnosed with an anti-NMDA receptor encephalitis. Um, but in general, um, the neurologic um, aspect of things is quite rare in kids who have um, COVID. Now on the outpatient side, um, that is starting to change a bit um, as more and more children now nationally have been diagnosed with COVID, we are starting to see the ramifications of that and we are starting to get more and more referrals for um, what they refer to as long haulers or long COVID. So these are chronic symptoms that patients have that don't, haven't been getting better over time or have taken a long time um, to get better despite the infection being long gone. So um, this group looked at 518 children who had been hospitalized with acute COVID and followed them um, up to nine months out um, this included hospitalized children because the groups of uh, outpatients are more difficult to study. And so um, what they found was that 25% of them had persistent symptoms at um, the time of their last follow-up, which is a pretty uh, significant number. The majority of these uh, patients' complaints included fatigue, insomnia, or um, non-restful sleep, and ongoing trouble with their smell and ongoing headaches. 
So this is a, a nice graph that um, shows that trend over time. So even though symptoms did improve, the further you get, um, there, were, there was a significant number of patients who still had symptoms well after their acute uh, presentation. So we still haven't figured out good ways to help these uh, patients. We're relying a lot on our uh, therapists, physical therapy, occupational therapy, um, and hopefully we will um, improve our ways of helping these patients. Here's our references. I'll open it up to questions. Thank you so much, Dr. Sweeney and Dr. Taylor. I have a couple of questions um, since it's just a hot topic. Are there any medications specific for any neurological manifestation or the treatment change? For example, if you're treating neurological manifestation of COVID like an like a ADEM or an optic neuritis, will that management change if somebody has a COVID infection? So we in general, we haven't used um, different treatment modalities than what we uh, ordinarily would. Um, so if somebody had an acute post-infectious um, inflammatory presentation, we would treat them similarly to someone who had, uh, with other infections. So anti-inflammatory steroids, um, plasmapheresis perhaps if the child was very sick. Um, we have um, been targeting um, so, so out of COVID has come um, some improvement in certain uh, abilities to test for things. So we now have a local uh, IL-6 assay that can be done rapidly. And the thought is that if uh, patients have a very elevated IL-6, we can target an IL-6 receptor to reduce the inflammatory load that that um, instills that some medicine called tocilizumab. Um, these are all anecdotal though. There's, you know, there's no control trials or um, real high level evidence. There's, to show benefit from those things. Okay. But they are being used rather uh, across the board throughout the country. Thank you so much. Uh, I have another question. Uh, since we're having so many variants, are there any information, uh, may not be pediatric neurology, but neurology in general, even like in adults, where the neurological manifestation would change with different variants? Um, so we're just now getting information about kind of the second wave of variant, the Delta variant. Um, and I have not heard of any clinical features that differ other than the um, infectivity being much higher for this uh, variant. Um, I'm sure that uh, at some point soon, we'll start to see um, groups reporting out their um, databases um, with that information, but I haven't seen that yet. Okay. And this is something uh, I wanted to ask. Are there any neurological side effects of the COVID vaccines. I knew you were gonna ask about the vaccine. <laughs> um, so uh, this is a hard question because the safety data for children is um, not fully published yet. And so we don't have all of that information. Um, for adults, the, um, the safety data looks very promising um, from a neurologic perspective. There are um, uh, case reports of post uh, vaccine um, inflammatory presentations like Guillain-Barre or um, other, uh, kind of, I'm sure everybody heard about the um, increased thrombotic risk um, or proposed thrombotic risk for one of the vaccines. Um, it, we have not seen an increase from what would be expected at a population level um, from people who are vaccinated. So um, there's really uh, does not appear to be a large risk for neurologic complications of the vaccines. Uh, this is a question from the audience. Uh, safety of pulse dose steroid use in neurological complications of COVID. Um, so we haven't had to use um, high dose steroids um, across many of our patients. Um, in general, when patients are sick enough to need steroids, then um, we think about the, um, the immediate benefit being much uh, better than the risk of giving a, a dose of steroids. The immunosuppressing effect of a steroid takes actually quite some time to take effect. And so um, really the anti-inflammatory aspect of the steroid um, act, acts much quicker rather than um, 
the, the risk of suppressing the immune system. So uh, I think of it as a safe procedure if, if we need to do that. And uh, uh, Dr. Pudi wanted to ask this question for you. Is there any concerns for patients with history of GBS or in neuroimmunological disorders and uh, vaccine, COVID vaccine? Yeah, um, I don't, I, I think we're still recommending even if people have had a history of Guillain-Barre or other post-infectious type of presentations that to still get the vaccine. This is a new um, type of vaccine and um, everybody's um, presentation with their Guillain-Barre or other um, disease really is unique to that patient. And um, it would be very hard to um, anticipate risk for recurrence of that same clinical scenario in a patient um, with an entirely different stressor. So I think it, in general, it would be considered safe. And I've not heard of um, any reports of people um, having an exacerbation or a relapse of that type of disease um, with pre-vaccination. 